Hi, this is Peter with CalcBook, and today we're going to be looking at a concrete spread footing with an eccentric pedestal. So we previously did a uh, video with just a uh, spread footing with a concentric pedestal, but now we're going to take a look and see what happens when we move that pedestal uh, off center of the foundation. So uh, we'll still be uh, looking at the vertical, lateral, and overturning forces, um, but now we have an additional moment due to that vertical load on top of the pedestal. So that, that vertical force um, offset by that eccentricity. And then because we were going to be uh, having that pedestal left or right of the center of foundation, we have to check both the left and right sides. We're looking at our sectional forces on each side and as well as our, our bearing pressure beneath each side. So again, for our stability checks, right, we'll be looking at bearing pressure, sliding, and overturning. And then for our strength checks, we'll be looking at one-way shear, two-way shear, and bending. Um, and you can see there for bending and uh, bending and one-way shear, uh, it's shown there on the right side of the pedestal, but we will check both the left and right side of the pedestal uh, during the design. So let's take a look at our problem statement. Right, We'll be using uh, ACI 318-19. We have an eccentricity of minus one foot six inches, so that's going to be to the left of center of the foundation. Our footing depth is two foot six. Our depth of soil above the footing is two feet. Our pedestal is 18 inches square. Our height of our pedestal is three feet. Our footing is 12 feet square. We have number nines at 12 inches on center. Our uh, compressive strength is 4,000 PSI. Our yield strength for the reinforcement is 60,000 PSI, and we have an allowable bearing pressure for dead plus live uh, of 3,000 PSF, and then we are permitted with a one-third increase for any earthquake or wind loading. And then our demands in the lower right corner there, we have a, a vertical dead load of 110 kips, a vertical live load of 80 kips, and those are both applied at the centroid of the pedestal. And then we have a lateral load due to earthquake of 25 kips, which is applied at the top of the pedestal. And then a overturning moment to the right there of 350 kip foot of, uh, from earthquake loading as well. So let's go ahead and open up CalcBook and we'll get started on the design. All right, we've got CalcBook open now. So go ahead and click into our ACI 318-19 design. And then we're gonna click into standalone. And then we're gonna click on our spread footing design and click continue to load up the spread footing design module. All right, and then we can start uh, putting in some information here on our left pane. So there's a few general questions about the foundation design that we offer the users. So whether or not you want to include the footing and the pedestal weight as part of the dead load, uh, the vertical soil weight as part of the dead load, uh, whether you want to check sliding and overturning, and then a question about whether or not the lateral loads are due to seismic or wind. In our case, they are due to seismic, so we're going to leave that as yes. Um, and then whether or not you're going to use the friction coefficient or cohesion uh, for sliding resistance. And then a question about including the top one foot of soil in your lateral calculation. This has to do with sort of what the constraints are, uh, whether you have a slab or just uh, bare soil uh, above the foundation. You can talk to your geotechnical engineer more about that. Um, and then we need to go ahead and start updating our footing dimensions. So we have a 12 foot uh, by 12 foot footing. It is two and a half feet deep, and there is two feet of soil. We'll leave the column location factor as an interior column. Uh, we we'll scroll down here. Our uh, footing is going to be 24 inches. Oops, not 24 feet, 24 inches. Uh, and then our pedestal width is going to be two feet as well. The height of the pedestal is three feet. The eccentricity is going to be minus 1.5 feet to the left. And then we need to update our reinforcement. We have number nines at 12 inches. So we have a number nine and a 12 foot wide footing. So we'll have a total of 13 bars. And then we need to update our allowable soil bearing pressure. So for dead plus live, we have three KSF. And then as you give me a warning here, because it's it wants to have the total bearing pressure being the same or greater, which makes sense. So we need to have this set to four KSF, which is our one third increase. Um, and then there's some other information here uh, for your soil properties, which you can update if you need to. And then our material properties for our concrete, and we'll leave that all as is. Okay, so then we need to go over to our demand tab and enter in our demands. We are gonna be using ASC 716 load combinations. Our axial demand is going to be uh, 110 kips for dead. It's going to be 80 kips for live. We have a moment demand uh, due to earthquake of 350 kip feet. And then we have a uh, 
shear demand due to earthquake of 25 kips. Okay, now that we've got that all loaded up, we can start to look into our design. Um, so first thing is the demand side, right? So uh, the first thing is we need to add in our supplemental loading. So our weight of uh, concrete, our weight of soil, uh, we add that all up into our total dead load. So we have a total dead load due to applied loading and self-weight of 199.4 kips. And then we have our moment demand and axial demand and shear demand. That's just going to be our load combinations. Uh, we'll come back and look at those as needed. But the first thing we needed to do is look at our bearing pressure. So we're going to look at our bearing pressure demand due to dead plus live, and then we'll look at it separately for seismic or wind since we have different allowables for those two uh, load combinations. So first we'll open up our dead plus live. And then we first thing we need to do is to calculate our uh, overturning moment and our axial. So first thing we need to do is actually uh, figure out what exactly is our axial load on the pedestal because that's going to affect our moment because it's eccentric. So we have to subtract off our footing weight and soil weight to get just the load that is applied um, at the pedestal as well as the self weight of the pedestal because that's what's going to create our moment due to the eccentricity. So we have a total load at the pedestal of 191.8 kips. Then we calculate our total moment, uh, and this includes any applied moments, which we don't have any for dead or live, um, our shear, which we don't have any for dead or live. So our all of our moment is just due to the eccentricity. So we have the 191.8 kips times an eccentricity of negative 1.5 feet, and that gets us a total moment of negative 287.7 kip feet, and that's negative, meaning it's overturning to the left. Um, so then we can calculate from there our current area, so just L over six, we then calculate our eccentricity, uh, which is just going to be our m over p, which gives us 1.03 feet. Uh, we take the absolute value of that for calculation purposes, but that's to the left because that's we have a negative moment. And then we can look at our bearing pressure. So this is our representative bearing pressure diagram, right? So overturning to the left with our pedestal offset to the left um, gives us a uh, left edge bearing pressure greater than the right edge. So our Q left is going to be 2.94 KSF, and our Q right is 0.94 KSF. And you can see actually here that is our controlling uh, design mode. So we have a total allowable bearing pressure of 3 KSF and a demand of 2.94 KSF. Um, then we can go and check our seismic or wind. We know it doesn't control, but we still want to take a look, right? So we recalculate our footing eccentricity using only load combinations that include seismic or wind. And in this case, it actually still uh, has no moment or shear for seismic. And that's because we are still using a load combination that has dead and live in it, which creates the worst case, um, the worst case uh, uh, eccentricity due to that, or, or worst case moment due to that eccentricity. And we can take a look at that, right? If we scroll back up to our load combinations and we look at our axial demand load combinations and we scroll down to look at our ASD load combination seismic or wind, right? It's using the dead plus 0.75 live plus 0.75 times 0.6 wind, right? Um, so this is what it's considering the worst case for uh, bearing pressure seismic or wind because this still is controlling with the dead and live loads. Um, and then we can calculate the bearing pressure based on that, which is still going to be overturning to the left, and it's slightly less than our dead plus live, um, so the dead plus live still controls. And once we've done that, we can go down to our uh, bending demand or our flexural calculations, right, to figure out what the moment demand is on the footing. So first thing we have to do is recalculate our bearing pressure using the ultimate uh, load combinations, right? So using our LRFD load combinations, we still go through the same process. Uh, and now we are utilizing uh, seismic uh, load combinations here. You can see our applied moment of 350 kip feet. Recalculate our eccentricity, right? And now we have this overturning to the right condition for our worst case ultimate load, which creates the worst bending moment. So we have a QU left of 1.64 KSF, a QU right of 2.79. And then we need to calculate the bearing pressure at the face of the pedestal, right? Because at this is face of the pedestal is where the critical section is. So that's where we calculate our bending moment. So we calculate those two values. 
And then from there, we can calculate the bending demand on both the left and right side of the pedestal, right? So this is sort of our general diagram here for what that looks like and how we're calculating the force of the, the bearing pressure diagram and then the distance or the moment arm to the centroid of those, of those areas to calculate what the bending moment is on the left and right side of the pedestal. So we calculate our F1, X1, our F2, and X2, and that gets us an, uh, an M left of 128 kip feet. And then we calculate our bending on the right side of the pedestal. Same thing, right? F1, X1, but these are all on the right side. And that gets us an M on the right of 655 kip foot. So the controlling demand there is obviously on the right side, and that's going to be a 655 kip foot bending demand on the right side of the pedestal. And then we can move on to our one-way shear demand, which is similar to our moment demand, right? We need to calculate a few initial parameters, figuring out what our depth to reinforcement is, our D value. And then we also want to figure out what our left uh, distance is from the face of the pedestal to the edge of the foundation. And then also on the right, because it's eccentric, right? The left side is shorter than the right side. And then we repeat the process here where we calculate the... Um, the, the bearing pressure now at this distance D away from the face so that we can figure out what our, our magnitude of this bearing pressure area is. And then we calculate our total shear demand on the left side, VU left, of 26.5 kips. And then we do the same thing on the right. And we calculate VU right of 133 kips. And obviously that controls of 133 kips. And then we can go down to our two-way shear demand where we are just going to take basically the average of this bearing pressure diagram, and we are gonna calculate at D over two away from the face of the pedestal and calculate that total volume or that total area uh, of bearing pressure uh, that gives us that total force for the two-way shear demand of 322 kips. And then we can move on to the capacity side of things. So we wanna calculate our sliding capacity, and previously we had said that we were gonna use friction. Um, in, a distance to the, in, in addition to the, to the lateral resistance of the, of the soil. But we want to exclude that top foot, so we basically take our total depth, we subtract, subtract a foot off, and we have a total depth of 3.5 feet that we can use um, for, for, bearing pre or for lateral pressure. We calculate our pressure at the top of the footing, our pressure at the bottom of the footing, our total sliding resistance due to that passive pressure. Then we calculate our sliding resistance due to the friction. And then we add those two up for our total sliding resistance. And then from there, we can calculate what our factor of safety is against sliding. So we define this, uh, what our limit was here in the, the capacity. Um, and so if we wanted to change this, we could change that uh, based on, on what our criteria is for sliding. And then we go to our overturning capacity. Right, we recalculate our moment based on the worst case for overturning which is gonna be that 0.9D, because that'll limit the, uh, the total deadline that we can use. And then we get an overturning, factor safety against overturning for, uh, for overturning as well. And then from there, we can move into our flexural capacity. We'll sort of brush over this a little bit since we've done this before. It's, it's a, a, just a concrete beam calculation um, with a bottom layer of reinforcement. So kind of your typical stuff here, getting your compression block, um, you know, getting your beta one value and then stepping through all of that to get your flexural capacity, MN, and then we calculate phi MN of nearly 1,500 kip feet, so plenty of capacity there. We check our one-way shear capacity, right, which is gonna be two square root of F prime C, B, D, and we don't uh, calculate any shear capacity due to steel reinforcement for spread foundations, and then we have our total phi VN of 361 kips. And then lastly, we calculate our two-way shear capacity, which has a few more calculations. We've got to calculate our punching shear perimeter. We have three different checks here for two-way shear capacity. And then we just take the minimum of those uh, three capacities to figure out what our nominal shear capacity is. And then there we apply our fee factor and get a total two-way shear capacity of 750 kips. So that is an eccentric spread footing uh, in CalcBook. Quite a lot of steps there, um, but it's uh, pretty straightforward once you just start clicking through. Uh, CalcBook is really good at, at displaying all the steps and all the information that you need to understand what the calculation is doing. So uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you're still watching and would like a 25% discount on your first month subscription of CalcBook, you can use the discount code YTCB2024, and we'll see you next time.